Chapter 10, Aroused, April through May, 1906. The demons we passed had the strangest looks on their faces too. Once they had been rich and wealthy and now all they owned were the clothes on their backs and their lives and they were in danger of losing those too. They looked shocked as if not quite believing that all of this could happen to them. I couldn't help remembering what fine houses and mansions had once been there and what richly dressed demons had eaten and drink with them. And now they were all gone in less than a minute. The demons we met would have been grateful now for a crust of bread or a cup of water, things that would have turned their backs on just 12 years ago. I felt very small. As we walked up the now deserted streets, Lefty warned us to watch out for demon soldiers. They shoot anybody they find because they assume that the person is a looter, but the soldiers are looters themselves. When I was coming here, I saw them drive one family out of their house and the owners were no sooner out of sight than they broke in and stole everything in sight. But the demon soldiers we met were good to us, father said. They told us about the wagon. That was because you had a demoness with you, Lefty grinned. From now on, trust to your feet and not to your good fortune. Once down the hill, we saw figures in khaki uniforms moving about. Lefty motioned us away and we eased back to the top of the hill where we would be out of sight. Then we hid behind a mound of rubble that had once been a house. We spent an anxious half hour there. From down the hill, we heard the sound of breaking glass and rough, coarse laughter. And then six demon soldiers walked by, their blankets rolls bulging with loot, valuables tucked into their belts. One demon even had a bushel basket full of trinkets. Their bayonets, bayoneted rifles were slung over their shoulders and their very red faces made me think that they had been drinking stolen liquor. They were puffing away on fat cigars. I suppose the cigars were stolen too. It was kind of scary. One day we were living in a law abiding community and the next day the city and the community had both dissolved with every person for himself. It struck me that father and I had probably walked by this house feeling as safe as we could feel in a demon street many times. And now here we were hiding behind what was left of it trying to keep from getting shot. It was about four in the afternoon when we got to the Tang people's town. The streets were pretty empty. There were more mounds of rubble where some houses had been. Others had lost their fronts or sides, revealing their insides like gutted animals. Rats skittered over the rubble, blinking evil red eyes at the harsh sunlight. It felt eerie being in the almost empty streets, for they always hustled and bustled with life at this time of day. Now, except for one or two scurrying people, we saw no one. Our own company building had stood up through the quake. The founder had been careful to select a sturdy building that had good wind and water vibrations, a phrase that meant it was in harmony with the rest of the universe. Uncle was standing at the door in pistol in his hand. One of his sleeves was torn and there was a cut over his eye, but otherwise he was as unchanged as the building. Well, it's as safe as they say, fools and children have all the luck, he said, but he looked relieved to see us. So no dragons got you, father stopped. And no dragon would dare shake your house, old man. Humph, <laughs> Uncle turned to me. You thirsty, boy? Yes, but do you have water? No, Lefty, Lefty laughed. Only his excellent and venerable collection of wines. Uncle sighed. And I think the earth shaking has so disturbed the wines that they'll turn bad. We've been drinking since this morning, Lefty said. Better save some of that, Father said. It'll be worth more than gold. That's where hand clap and white deer are seeing it's put away where it'll be safe in the park. We moved inside the company building. It was cool and refreshing in there in the wood shadows. The ironing shelves had been taken down along with everything else. And the only things left were the stove and uncle's prized chair, looking lonely and forlorn in the center of the empty room. Uncle sat down in it heavily, the pistol still in his hand. He looked even more immovable than the stove or the building. All of us sat down around him on the floor. It was strange to see the air unclouded with steam and not to hear the sound of washing from the back. You must have a mound of stuff in the park, father said. No, just the necessities, uncle shrugged. Most of it's in Oakland. That was the city across the bay from San Francisco. How did you get it over there? Father asked. On a classmate's boat, uncle said simply. Superior men help one another in a time of need. We finished the packing while uncle supervised us. And by the time we had the last wagon load ready, Handclap had come back. Red Rabbit immediately looked for some sugar in my pants pocket, but he had, be, he had to be satisfied with my promise of some in the future. It had been funny to see Red Rabbit moving speedily for him up the street, for like us, he did not enjoy being around the rats much. 
We stopped loading for a moment to listen to the crump, crump, crump of cannon. They're blasting some of the houses with cannon, Lefty explained. They are trying to lay a fire break by blowing up some houses. On the way in, Handclap added, I saw them setting dynamite in a drugstore just down the street. He grunted as he hefted a box onto the bed of the wagon. Going to start around here too. You better come with us. We all urged Uncle to do it, but Uncle shook his head determinedly. Someone has to wash this building. But there's nothing left to take but your stove and your chair. Nonetheless, Uncle tucked his pistol into his belt. The superior man tends to his own garden. At that moment, there was a loud explosion that made us all duck, and we saw a huge column of fire and smoke rise over the buildings. Flaming bits of wreckage scattered all over. Uncle shook his head. Those fool demons are using too much dynamite. They must have some amateurs on. Why, on the railroads, we'd only have use half the charge that to blast our way into a mountain. A moment later, we saw plumes of black smoke rise from the Tang People's Town. Some of the wreckage must have landed within the Tang People's Town and set fire to what buildings still remained fairly intact. It would not be long before most of the Tang People's Town, the buildings being almost all of wood, would be on fire. Uncle planted his feet firmly on the ground and folded his arms across his chest. I'm staying. Handclap planted his feet just as firmly. Then I'm staying too, he announced. So am I, Lefty said. Yes, we'll all stay, father said. Uncle glared around at all of us. He was not used to being disobeyed. He scratched his jaw, then angrily for some time. Finally, he grumbled, Well, someone with sense better nurse made the lot of you, young rascals. Put my chair on the wagon, but mind you, don't scratch it. Uncle supervised the stowing away of his ancient chair and then sat down on it. He turned around to look at the building for one last time. It's just as well. That old building was too drafty anyway but he was fighting back the tears. None of us said anything as Handcock clicked his tongue and Red Rabbit jerked the wagon forward. It was a regular tent city in the park when we finally got there. Cooking fires had spread up and down the park and lines were forming to get the bread or the tents and the, that the demon soldiers were handing out. Other demon soldiers were busy digging latrines. I found out that the demon soldiers had been doing this all day. So there were some good demons as well as bad ones. The Tang people had tried to gather into a group. I saw some tents here and there, for the most part, old ones with patches on them, or tents improvised out of sheets. There was a particularly dazzling one of bright purple silk sheets. Father and I both recognized them as sheets that we used to pick up from a demon millionaire. I suppose Handclap had picked them up a few days ago and that they had been cleaned but not returned. Out of some perverse pride, Uncle had told them to use those sheets for the tent. White Deer grunted when he saw us. Good, now one of you can go stand in the bread line. Handclap set off with a basket on one arm. We had our own food, but the bread would mean we could make it last longer. We could have the bread for breakfast and lunch if we planned it right. Father, Lefty, and I began to unload the wagon while White Deer started a fire. Uncle, Father said, do you think Moonshadow and I could bring some food over to friends? The only demon food we'll have will be the bread Handclap is bringing back, Uncle warned us. White deer stocked a good pantry for tank people, but I don't know if demons would agree. They're a big and a little demoness. We've shared some meals together. Anyway, they're not the type to complain. One of these days, Uncle wagged a finger at Father, you will appeal to my better side once too often and my poor, overburdened, sentimental, soft heart will die of the extra load. But till then, Father said with a grin, go on, go on. Uncle waved us away and went inside the tent. We found Miss Whitlaw and Robin trying their best to erect a tent. Here, let me help, Father said. Oh, Mr. Lee, thank goodness you're here, Miss Whitlaw said. We were so frightened. We heard about the soldiers shooting anyone they found in the streets. Father only smiled and went to work setting up the poles correctly, giving directions to me and Robin. Miss Whitlaw added, and you must be hungry, Moonshadow. We saved some bread for you. It was like Miss Whitlaw to have saved half of her own meager dinner for her guests. No need. We have dinner for you as our guests, my father said. A real Chinese dinner? Robin asked. Yes, I said. Why, how marvelous. You and Robin should go, dear. I'm really feeling quite full. But we suspected the truth. Miss Whitlaw did not want to impose upon her neighbors again and ask them to watch their things. Besides, it was evening and they might want to go to sleep early. No need to wait behind, father said. I watch things. But I couldn't. Then save me some. And he shoved us all out of the tent. I was a little afraid then at having to play the host to Robin and Miss Whitlaw, but then I realized that they were probably just as afraid of being my guests. And I thought of what Mother had said. 
if anyone had been an empress in some former life, at least among demons, if not among the Tang people, it was Miss Whitlaw. All the Tang people stared as we made our way among the tents to the sheet tent of the company. Miss Whitlaw seemed to lose ten years and become sprightlier. This reminds me of the circus, Robin, she said as she picked her way over the top, the top ropes of the tents. Except there's no lemonade to drink, Robin said. You ever been to a circus, Moon Shadow? No, I admitted. We must take you when this is all over, Miss Whitlaw said and then paused. We had come into a space where the trees and the tents didn't shut out our view of the city to the east. The night sky was a bright fiery red from the fires raging in the city. It did not seem like evening, I realized suddenly, but more like a perpetual sunset. Small white things began to shower down. At first, I thought it was snow and got excited, but Miss Whitlaw said the white stuff was ashes. I noticed then that everyone had adopted the hushed voices of the afternoon. There was a strange silence over the camp. People didn't look back at the city where their houses had been. The company was waiting inside the tent. They looked a little edgy at having to eat with demons. Something smells delicious, Miss Whitlaw said. White Deer looked at me. I translated her words and White Deer grunted, but I could tell he was pleased. And then Miss Whitlaw brought out the universal gift that is cherished in all cultures. From her hamper, which she had carried over her arm, she took out a dusty old bottle. It was of brown glass, and the light of the kerosene lamp was reflected in it as if there was a little genie trapped inside. This is a bottle of my very own plum brandy, Miss Whitlaw said to me. Papa used to make it, and I never quite got out of the habit, even though I rarely use it, and she added quickly, only for medicinal purposes. Uncle held the bottle between his hands as if it were a delicate flower. We waited expectantly. He turned the bottle around in his hands and then called for the corkscrew. I got it. Uncle studied the cork and then worked the point into the cork as if it were a diamond cutter. He hated to get bits of cork into the wine. The cork came out with a satisfying pop, and Uncle sniffed the bottle. Delicious, he pronounced. I had a cup all ready for him. He poured some of the rich amber liquid into it. It looked as thick as syrup. He drank about half the cup and smacked his lips. Delightful, he said, and poured another cup for himself. The rest of us tried it. It was sweet and fiery and seemed to settle in your stomach with a warm feeling, like spring was inside you. Refreshing, Uncle declared and poured himself a third cup. Well, Anybody who could make brandy like that was all right with Uncle. At dinner, he even gave Miss Whitlaw, a woman in a demoness to boot, the seat of honor in his favorite chair. It was an honor that Uncle might not have given the emperor himself, not even a real emperor of the Tang people, to say nothing of that upstart Manchu, one that claimed the throne. We had forks out for them, but Miss Whitlaw won extra points by asking Uncle to teach her how to use chopsticks. She took so quickly to them that I was positive that she must have been a Tang woman in another life. Robin, though, stuck to her fork and knife. White Deer had done himself proud once again, not so much for the demon's sake, because he could not have known we would have invited demons, but because of the company's honor. There was a kind of salted fish which is delicious with rice. You break off little flakes because one flake is salty enough to flavor a bit of rice. There were vegetables, including choy, which is a little like the demon broccoli, only with yellow flowers. There was barbecued pork, roast pork with an oyster sauce, and cold boiled chicken. And afterwards, we finished off the brandy and sang a little. Miss Whitlaw sang Barbara Allen in a high, ethereal voice, with Robin helping her. The company did not know the words, but the tune itself was lovely, and when I summarized the story for them, the company all agreed it was a fine song. Then Robin recited a poem, The Highwayman, which she had learned to act out in school. It was about how a bandit is saved from an ambush of soldiers when his true love blows away half her chest. I can't remember exactly how she does it, but I think she pulls the rifle of one soldier so that it's pointed right at her chest. The surprised soldiers pull the trigger and the noise of the explosion warns her lover away. I helped to translate it and the company enjoyed it. Bandit stories are always popular with us. And for our part, we sang some pleasant songs and acted out some of the stories about Monkey, which we had done once for a guild banquet. All in all, it was a fine evening, and we were sorry it had to come to an end. Three days later, on a Saturday morning, as we were making breakfast, the camp learned that the firefighters had begun to get the upper hand. When they got the water from, I do not know, maybe they'd used some of the underground cisterns that had been laid down a long time ago, but that had been ignored, or maybe they used salt water from the bay. Besides, there wasn't that much left of the city to try to protect now. In any event, we heard that the firefighters were winning and it was about 7.30 when the rains began. Now the rains come, Uncle said disgustedly. He lifted the flap of the sheet to watch it come down. 
We might have had to leave here too, White Deer said. Things could have gone wrong for the firefighters again, and then nothing could have been saved. Uncle just snorted, convinced that it was part of the general ineptitude of the deities who were in charge of the universe. He let the flap down. The sheets had already begun to sag on top, and the water ran down into the tent, spattering inside. Uncle sat stubbornly in his chair, opening up his umbrella and holding it over his head. A superior man, he informed us, is above such things as getting wet. Uncle, how about coming with me to visit Miss Whitlaw? Father asked. We were all sure that her canvas tent would be drier. And for all of Uncle's pronouncements to the contrary, he was terribly grumpy when he was cold and wet. Uncle rubbed his elbow. What for? Father pointed to a box of apples that had been sent down from the north from some of our kinsmen. She might like some of those. You take them, but they're your apples. White Deer poked Uncle in the ribs. Go on, the, the superior man shares his wealth and adversity. It was White Deer who had to tend Uncle when he had a cold. Yes, go on, Handclap encouraged. I'm sure she'd like the fruit. He probably had the same vision of what it would be like inside the tent if Uncle had a cold. As Handclap said, when Uncle sneezed, he made such a noise that he would scare away the Lord of the East Wind, and he was used to noise. It might be good to hear a sensible person talk for a change, Uncle observed and stood up. Come, Moonshadow, I'll need someone to hold the umbrella. Uncle splashed majestically through the puddles of the water on the ground, slightly hunched over so I could cover him with the umbrella. The Whitlaws were just finishing tea when we came. Miss Whitlaw thanked us for the apples and graciously asked us to sit in her good parlor chairs. Uncle sat down with the stately dignity he could manage when he wanted to. Miss Whitlaw went outside to where someone had rigged a lean-to out of branches to shelter a fire. She brought in some hot water in a teapot to make more tea. When she had served us, I said, Uncle's been all over Miss Whitlaw. He's even been in the mountains. I there, Uncle said, working on Central Pacific. Why, I had a cousin who worked his way west on the Union Pacific, Miss Whitlaw said. It was on the Avis Railroad that started from the east. He wrote long letters about it. Uncle immediately picked up interest when I translated for him. They launched into a long discussion of their memories, both of railroading and of the Sierras. I had no idea the mountains could be so big or so cold or so beautiful. And from there, Miss Whitlaw began asking questions about the Middle Kingdom, and Uncle, given a topic he knew something about, grew even more comfortable. All in all, it wasn't a bad visit. When the rain stopped and Uncle decided it was time to head back, he did not want to dip into their larder by having lunch with them, as Miss Whitlaw urged. We made our goodbyes. Going back to our tent, Uncle twirled the new fo now folded umbrella. When we have the company set up again, you bring her over for dinner sometime, then we'll give her a proper dinner. <laughs>